Okay, awesome. So welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us today. We've got some pretty interesting stuff to share with you all today. So let's just get started. All right, so um, just to quickly introduce ourselves, my name is Veronica. I'm a recruiting coordinator at Better. Um, I've been with the company for about nine months now, and I focus on um, the engineering and design team. Hey, I'm Gina. I am a recruitment team lead at Better. Uh, I've been at Better for two and a half years now, and I work on uh, roles that relate to product management, data, and IT. Hey everyone, um, my name is Lisa Yin. I'm currently a senior technical recruiter here at Better. Um, I've been at Better for close to two years now and I actually joined the team when the engineering team was roughly about 50 and now we here are we at about 150. So we've definitely, you know, tripled uh, since I've been here. It's been a super exciting time. Um, and of course, you know, this workshop is about LinkedIn. Um, so I definitely want to point out my profile picture um, in this slide that this is not a, or this is an example of a, not a great LinkedIn picture. You know, um, I'm the one that's supposed to be job searching, uh, not my fabulous dog Kodak. Um, so, you know, just an example here that, you know, your headshot should be just you. Um, and I'll pass it back to Veronica. All right, so um, before we dive in to the meat and potatoes, um, just wanted to give a little background on better. Um, our mission here is to make homeownership more affordable, accessible, and just better for everyone. So um, for me, as a first generation Latina born in the US, I've always admired my parents and others like them for immigrating to the US and being able to achieve like the American dream of own owning a home despite, you know, the many obstacles that they had to face. And so homeownership definitely means like financial independence, building generational wealth, a place for you and your family to gather and build memories. So um, homeownership has become more difficult for many reasons um, recently, and the industry itself lacks transparency and accessibility. So um, that's something that better really aims to, you know, kind of make better. <laughs> um, and so for today, um, what we're going to focus on is um, why is LinkedIn important? Um, LinkedIn don'ts, LinkedIn do's, how to make it better. And um, we'll even do a live profile review where um, we can go over a volunteer's LinkedIn profile and give you some tips. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Lisa. Everyone. Um, so I want to first discuss, you know, why is LinkedIn important? Um, LinkedIn is a recruiter's main tool to go find and connect with candidates. Um, and there are currently about 1.6 million engaged um, professionals on LinkedIn today. Um, and it's growing every day because, you know, a lot of college students are now signing up. Um, and because of the large pool of professionals, uh, recruiters are able to find and connect and manage candidates and prospective candidates with job openings. Um, and it's really great in a sense that it actually helps a recruiter manage manage your different projects, um, different roles. Um, so it's been an amazing uh, tool for me, uh, as well as our recruiting team. Um, so moving on, um, I can definitely talk about, you know, the LinkedIn don'ts. Um, Veronica, next slide. Thank you. Um, so, you know, what not to do on your LinkedIn? First of all, is very self-explanatory. Uh, don't lie. Um, use LinkedIn as your resume. Um, recruiters like to, you know, look at it in a sense of your resume. So, you know, don't write any, you know, uh, lies on there. Don't present false information. Um, and of course, you know, this is uh, this screenshot is a example, uh, just like my uh, headshot, of you know um, what not to put on your LinkedIn. So, don't use a headshot with a filter or a Snapchat filter, um, definitely not very professional um, in a way. And of course, you know, you treat LinkedIn the same way, um, you know, as your resume. So you don't 
treat it as a social media account. Um, so try to avoid heavy filtered kind of profile pictures. And of course, the next one is don't get too wordy. Um, recruiters like to look at resumes very quickly. Um, I believe we spend an average of about 30 to 45 seconds per LinkedIn page. Um, so please don't get too wordy, uh, get straight to the point. Um, we would definitely love to, you know, of course, get what you're doing um, all in one go. Um, and of course, you know, we like to see um, profiles that provide context to your job history by telling you, um, by telling your story. So think of words as, you know, um, more, think of words as, you know, as a cost. So the more words on your resume, um, the more expensive it is to read. Um, so pick your words strategically um, and be able to, you know, be concise. And of course, uh, don't leave out your contact information. Uh, you know, for example, uh, for me, when I recruit for engineers, I love to see that uh, a candidate um, has their email for me to reach out to, um, and as well as you know their LinkedIn message. I can shoot them an email both ways, and in mail um, if they have a number. Definitely be like, hey, you know, are you up for a call sometime? Definitely an easy way to make a connection, and it cuts out a lot of different steps, um, and we can speed up the process that way. Um, and moving on to, you know, uh, moving on to the don't flood your profile with too many keywords um, if they don't relate to your work. Um, so like I mentioned before, recruiters take a 30, 45 minute glance on your, on your LinkedIn. So definitely be able to put in things that, you know, relate to your role in general. Um, and for us to really understand what your role entails. Um, and of course, you know, don't ask people you don't know for recommendations or endorsements. Uh, of course, endorsements are great. You know, they show case your skills, um, but you know, we want to make sure that the people who you know endorse you uh, are endorsing you for the right skill um, and not necessarily just any skill in general. And lastly, you know, don't fill your summary with stories that aren't relevant to your professional life. It would be, you know, I definitely would love to get to know you as a person, but definitely your professionalism comes first in a sense that we want to know what you're interested in doing for your next role or your next career move. Um, and then, you know, we can always talk about what you're interested in uh, afterwards in a sense that, you know, in your summary, you could be like, you know, hobbies, swimming, um, taking Kodak on walks and, you know, reading. Um, so that's just a little um, excerpt on LinkedIn don'ts, and I'll pass it on to Gina, who will tell you exactly what to do. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, those are all super important to keep in mind. And a lot of the information is, you know, sort of like the opposite of what you want to do. Um, so, of course, you want to keep it professional. You want to make sure, like Lisa said, that Yes, it is a social media, but this is a professional form of social media where, you know, on your Facebook, you could blog about running into somebody at the store and you had a really bad interaction with them and they were rude. Leave it off LinkedIn is what I would recommend. I would say instead on LinkedIn, um, like we have the example of a milk car here who works it better. They talk a lot about how they've developed uh, iOS and Android applications. They talked about how they engage users via gamification techniques. Like these are all things that are fantastic and really relevant to the skills we're looking for as recruiters. And then like Lisa said, if you want to add at the end, like I love baking. I have a cupcake business on the side. Check out my cupcake blog if you love cupcake baking too. That's fantastic. Um, but definitely keep your LinkedIn because we are taking only a couple seconds per, per page. Um, you want to make sure that the thing that's really highlighted is your professional skills. Um, you also want to make sure that when it comes to a headshot, it's really clean and it's really clear um, because very much like how you would interact with somebody in person for an, um, you know, any sort of like interview, uh, you want to make sure that they can see you very clearly. There's just one person. It's also a professional photo. Like this is how you'd show up for a job interview. Um, and we have some examples later on in the process, but similar to the person we saw previously, really uh, like a diluted photo with kind of a very dark, lots of filters on it. Can't really even see that person. Uh, so it doesn't make the best first impression whenever you're just looking through people's faces and, um, you know, you want to kind of engage a recruiter. And the best way I think to do that is to make sure that it's really clean and clear and professional headshot. 
uh, definitely make sure your work history is up to date. Uh, it will waste your time and the recruiter's time if, uh, say, Emil Carnell was a senior director of software engineering and we re were reaching out for IC roles, it would uh, obviously not be the best use of his time if he's like, well, I'm way more senior than that. If his profile isn't up to date, it's not going to be the best uh, impression on a recruiter who is trying to see the profile as it stands today and then reach out to you for roles that are really applicable to that. Uh, and then also a lot of things that um, Lisa talked about previously, you really want to keep it simple, make it concise, really explain like what the objective of your team and your work is and use as much examples as you can. For, for a recruiter, I might say I'm owning you know, 15 to 30 roles at a time, speaking with 10 to 15 candidates a day. These are a lot of like hard pieces of data that a hiring manager could look at and say, wow, like that's really impressive work. And it sounds like they can take on the workload that we have for them in this new job. Uh, and then also, uh, like we talked about uh, previously, you definitely want to include your contact information and email address. If you have a resume and you're really actively looking for a job, there's a place to upload that as well. Uh, this will make sure that recruiters are able to engage with you really quickly and easily. And something very important about the LinkedIn algorithm, just so you guys know, is that when a recruiter engages with you, even if you're actually not very interested in that role, it's best to actually respond because the algorithm is then going to push you to the top of our lists. Uh, there are, like we showed, you know, over a million people on LinkedIn. And you want to make sure that you are, if you're looking for a job, at the top of the algorithm. So if you're responding to recruiters, LinkedIn is going to push you to the top of our searches. Even if you respond, somebody says, hey, do you want to be a, um, a you know, I don't know, an, an IT analyst. I don't work in that, so I'm not super interested, but I might reply and say, thank you so much for reaching out. I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, not interested right now, but let's connect if you have something in recruiting in the future. That is going to push me to the top of the algorithm and then more hiring managers that I do want are going to see my profile. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so here we go. When we talk about what makes a professional um, headshot versus not professional headshot, this is something you can do without having to hire a professional photographer. Um, my headshot that we saw at the beginning, I took this on my iPhone. I just went outside during a part of the day where it was pretty sunny. Uh, and then I made sure that I put it on portrait mode. I'm sure you don't even need to put it on portrait mode if you don't you know, have that on your phone. Uh, but just make sure that in this, you know, the before uh, photograph here, this person is so far away. The photograph is such a low quality. Uh, that's why it's very tiny. I can't even see if that is a person. It could be like three toddlers in a trench coat. I don't know. But clearly the second photograph is a very professional headshot where I can see this person's face. They look friendly, like they're in you know, it seemed to be an engaging person. I am excited to reach out to Andrea and chat with her more. This person at the top, I like, when's the last time they updated this? Are they even active on this? It is obviously a very like superficial thing, but it really does work that if you have a clear and clean and professional photograph, it's sort of like brushing your hair to a job interview. It's like, wow, they look pretty nice. Like, let's let's engage with them. Just gives you like a little bit of a boost when, you know, we're looking through hundreds of profiles a day. All right, next one. Cool. So does anybody want us to review their profile and see if they have anything they can improve or things they're doing well? If you're very shy, we can obviously like, you know, I'm happy to go over mine or somebody else's on the panel too. No one be a question, but I think it wouldn't be good enough. It, that's now it's too wordy. No problem. Well, I'm, I'm it looks like we have some volunteers. Uh, Annabelle actually put the link to their profile in the chat. So, Veronica, if you want to click on it, and then Emily as well. Awesome. Thank you guys. Wow, so many willing volunteers. You guys are amazing. So I think Veronica is clicking on them and going to share very shortly. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so we're first going to go with Vitor. Am I saying that correctly? Please correct me if not. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yep. All right. 
let me put on my analyzing glasses for a moment. I gotta pull it up on my screen. The first thing I would say is education, technology, and innovation enthusiasts. That is actually fantastic, but I wouldn't put it as your headline necessarily. I would actually put it as the job title that you have or have previously held or the job title you want. This is because um, if I am searching for somebody, it looks like user experience design. This is something you're interested in or project management. Um, that's what I'm actually most looking for in someone's profile. I want to know that they either have those skills um, or that's a job title they've held most recently. So instead of what you're interested in or what you're enthusiastic about in the title, I would actually put like the job description you've most held or the job description you want. You could say inspiring UX designer, insp aspiring project manager, or if you've recently been a project manager or a UX designer, I would put that. And then in your about section, you I think this is fantastic what you have here. You say what your bachelor degree is in, um, that you have an educational technology specialization. Like this is a really fantastic about. Um, and then I think your interests are great. Like you, it shows that you're clearly interested in the piece that you had up top, right? Like innovation, education, technology. I think that's fantastic. And you obviously have a really great headshot where I can see you clearly. Uh, I love the background and you're open to work. That's awesome. And then let me see, I actually can see your, your phone number when I hit your contact info, but uh, I would actually go into your contact info today. If you scroll up top, Veronica, and if you hit contact info next to Sao Paulo, Brazil, it actually doesn't show your recruiter or a recruiter, um, your email there. So I'd actually go in and update that and add your email so that if I had a job for you, I could easily click the email and be like, hey, Vitor, want to chat with you. Uh, some recruiters just have a strong preference for email over LinkedIn recruiting messaging. So that is sort of why we do that. Cool. So we can move on to somebody else's. Thank you so much, Vitor. Obviously, you overall have a really great profile. OK, let me see who, is, who else we can. Um, yeah, let's. How about Annabelle? Let me click on her. Um, Maria, in the meantime, I'll, I'll answer your question. You said, how about a career switcher? What would the headline state be? I think that uh, similar to what I said to Vitor is like, if you want to say aspiring, um, I think that's okay. I see that every day. I work in product management and a lot of people are trying to switch into product management. So they might say aspiring product manager. That is really great because I know if I have something that is more entry level or doesn't require as many firm years of experience in product management, that's a really easy way for me to like instantly see that you're an aspiring, you know, whatever you're aspiring to be. And then I would obviously follow all of the same tips we had previously. Um, and in the sub, you know, the summary, say what you were doing previously and why you're interested in this new career path. And then I will look over Annabelle. Let me just pull it up on my screen as well. So obviously she has a fantastic head headshot that's super clear, so professional. That shirt is something I would absolutely wear to an interview. I love her background, be the change you wanna see in the world, very inspirational. I also love the pronouns. I think it's super inclusive and I think everybody should have that in there. Um, I love all of the, you know, sort of, um, keywords we have here, problem solver, change advocate, but similar to the advice I gave Vitor as well, I think those are all amazing things and I want you to have them in your about or in your summary, but I actually would recommend putting, it looks like um, currently you've been working freelance in policy specialist, uh, legal, government, and public policy, and you're available for new contracts. If I was looking for somebody to work on a contract for you know, creating public policy, I would hope in their headline, it would be like, you know, public policy advocate or um, public policy like writer or uh, human rights writer, whatever it is that you specialize in or focus in. And like, if you're a contractor, especially what you're looking to make money in today, I would absolutely change that as the headline. And then take all of those amazing keywords that I love and I want you to keep in your profile, but move them down to the about section so that the you know, I first goes to, you know, this person is a public policy writer. Because uh, if you only looked at just that, I actually probably couldn't tell that you did do that. And if I was, you know, 
yeah. we have to say that it kind of stinks. Recruiters are moving really quickly. I wish we all had like infinite time, but because they're moving so fast, they may miss it. Yeah, I think, well, I, I'm looking uh, to transition into po tech policy in, in cyber crime and safety. So um, right. definitely that's where I'm going with that. But thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, I think that's fantastic and something you can write. Um, I love what you have right now, your experience that you currently work on, you know, the policy related projects focus on human rights, cyber crime, safety, immigration, healthcare. And if you want to at the top, change it to like, you know, sort of like technology focused uh, public policy writer or whatever sort of the catchy headline for the job you're looking for is, is something I would definitely recommend. Great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. And then we have, I think, uh, Emily Henson was next, it looks like. Okay, let me. Okay, Emily. Oh, here it is. This is pretty good. We have business, business systems manager at Guild Education, super clear. We have an amazing headshot, great background. I love your about, it's super clear. You also have your strengths and your skills. It's pretty good. The, wow, I feel like you've already taken this course. Um, this is a really, really strong one, to be honest. This is great. I think the only thing is if you were actively looking for a job today, something I would include is that in, your current role and any of these roles that don't have any bullet points, I would add a couple of bullet points. And I'm gonna share something that is kind of like gold that I tell a lot of my friends. So if you want a job, um, say you're looking for another job as a manager for business systems, I would go and look at all of the jobs for manager business systems that you want and look at some of the key words in those job descriptions. And a lot of those are probably things you've done use that as inspiration for what to add here. So if it says that you, um, you know, worked with internal teams to solve issues, perfect. Like think of a time that you worked with an internal team to solve a specific issue, put it in there, and then maybe even be like, solved it within, you know, 75% of the time, or like 75% time savings that the previous team had, had done it in, or solved it in only three days when expected project was 10 days, something like that. So. I would definitely look up online the types of jobs you want, see those job descriptions. And if you have overlapping experience, you're going to see a lot of things you've probably already done. And those are the things you want to highlight in your LinkedIn, same as your resume. Because if I'm the recruiter or the manager of business systems at, say, you want to work at Facebook, I'm using those keywords to find you. And if I can't find them in there, I might not find your profile. So honestly, it's a pretty great uh, profile overall, but I would say I would certainly add bullet points under the manager and the team lead because I don't see any keywords there. And it's something that's gonna help you to find your next job. Thank you, that's super helpful. I haven't looked for a job in five years and I'm doing very different work. So I've always struggled with, is my LinkedIn right for my current job if I wanna look for something new? Yeah, you have a really great LinkedIn. I would definitely reach out to this person. They, you know, kind of have a lot of information in here that's super helpful. They have a lot of tools they've worked with. Like even whenever you go under business system analyst, you have all of these systems tools that you've worked with. And these are keywords that if you have experience working with these, it's very, very helpful for a recruiter to see this because I'm going to be looking for somebody that has experience with Zendesk. I'm going to be looking for somebody who's worked with DocuSign and I'm going to be typing those keywords in and you're going to rise up on the top of the list of people who are going to reach out or come out that I'll reach out to because of those things. So great profile. And then I'm happy to answer. It looks like we have some questions in here too. Trying to, um, how should one address being out of the workforce for an extended time in their work history? I think that's totally okay. I mean, on your resume, I see people all the time say took a travel hiatus or they say took time off to spend 
time with my family, um, became a parent for the first time. People write that in their profiles all the time. And that's fantastic. Like, I think that at our company, nobody would ever hold it against you for taking time off to travel or to become a parent um, or whatever it might be. I think a recruiter is certainly going to ask, like, what were you up to? Um, just out of curiosity. But if you can include any sort of information, it'd probably be helpful. Um, and then also there are, you know, obviously reduction forces that happen that are out of everybody's hands. And so while you might not always want to put it directly on your LinkedIn, I, I would, you know, potentially call it out on my resume and say left because reduction in force took some time off to regroup and then started a new role. And that makes it really clear to the recruiter. Okay. Reduction in force that happens every day. And they got a new role. And, you know, I think that's pretty standard. Yeah, and um, Gina, I did just want to add that um, some companies, like I know it better, um, when we do our interviewer training, we actually train the interviewers not to ask about gaps in resume because you just never know, like if someone has like a medical issue or anything um, personal that could be going on, like that shouldn't, you know, reflect, reflect badly on the employee. So um, that's also um, something that, you know, companies that really care about like interviewer training and bias and all of that will make sure to like include. Absolutely. That's great to highlight. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah, there will, there might be a company that asks about it, but hopefully most of the companies have sort of the same mindset that better does that like, it's really not our business. And like, we don't really care if you have the right skills. Sounds good to us. Like we want you in the job. And then how many titles should we list? Is there a good number to have? Um, so maybe I can get some clarification on this one. Does this mean like overall or do you currently have many different titles? I think um, Hattie or Haiti, if I'm saying that correctly. It's Hattie. And um, I guess I was looking at um, the person who's, who's, res who's LinkedIn you looked at before this yeah. and she had DNI you know, champion and, you know, first generation Latina. And I don't remember what else, but they were probably like five or six different titles. And I guess I was just kind of curious, like, is there a best practice around that? Because I'm, um, you know, it's good to know where should we stop? Because there's lots of ways to describe ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that when it comes to the title, um, the same advice I gave to her is the, the advice I'll give to all of you. What Emily has here, the, the one title that she holds now at the company she's at uh, is going to be what I most recommend. If you're out of work, that may not always be possible, but I would recommend putting the most recent job title you had. Or if you are a student, I would even say that like recent graduate at, you know, um, but, like, but what if you are like a DEI evangelist or like you're, you know, you're looking to pick up some mentees because you do mentoring or you're part of a board or something sure. like that and you want to like highlight that? Sure. I would definitely highlight it in your about section. And then also, if you go down to experience, if you scroll down, Veronica, to experience, you can put multiple titles down here. So, you know, uh, it actually looks like Emily does have that. She has the vice chairperson of Unidos, the Guild ERG that she's currently a part of, and she's a manager of business systems. So I think that is the way I would recommend. There's This isn't a perfect science, so there's no one right way to do it, but that's what I would recommend because if you, it depends on your goals. If you're actively looking to get a new job, I have the recruiter lens. So my recruiter lens is going to want to find the job title this person has so that I can place them in a new job. Uh, but it really does depend on your goals, what you list as your, your title. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Also, I want to add, um, since you mentioned like DI advocate or something like that, um, when recruiters put in our Boolean string to find, you know, DI advocates, um, as long as you have it on your profile, no matter if it's a title, experience, or summary, it will pull you up. Um, so, you know, it's not necessary just to put it in three different places. Okay, great, thanks. Then it looks like we had another question um, from Monica. Should we use the STAR method on LinkedIn or should it only be used on your resume? I think that the STAR method is a really great way to approach kind of anything, but it, it does depend if it does get too wordy. Um, I think that bullet points are really fantastic. And so if you can get something into a bullet point format, um, I know the like 
English class rule would be if a sentence is approaching three lines, that's too long for a sentence. I would say that is like that stands here, but I would even maybe like say maybe two lines if you're doing just one sentence, just because it is a resume, you want to keep it sort of brief. Uh, so yes, if you can use star, that's fantastic, but you are right to be mindful of creating something too wordy where it's kind of a run on sentence with three or four lines. Oh, I'm missing any other questions here. I think there was one, what about if you are applying to different positions? So something that I have seen is you can do sort of, again, maybe those two titles. Um, if you're looking for to be a UX designer and also a product manager, you're happy with either, you have experience in both. But what I will say is, you know, not, nothing is perfect. You may want to target like your LinkedIn to the job you feel like you have more experience in or the job you're more interested in uh, because it's almost like the if you try to be both you might not fit into either box so i would think about which job you're more passionate about or which one you're more actively pursuing but then when it comes to your resume and you're submitting resumes you can have two separate resumes like that's fine have one for ux have one for product submit them for different roles but it is difficult with linkedin because you only have one so i would say you can either do the approach where you perhaps try to make it very clear that you have both skill sets and you're open to both opportunities which could work or you could really try to tailor it towards sort of one line of work and use your resume for the other Um, and I see that there's a question um, from Mario in a sense that which area within LinkedIn profile do you spend the most of your time reading as a recruiter? I personally um, spend most of the time on the experience part, um, just more about, you know, what they're currently working on, um, some bullet points, uh, different projects, as well as, you know, their past experience. If, you know, for instance, if I'm looking for a senior software engineer, um, I would go through their experience be like hey um, they spent x amount of years at american express um or two years at another company i'd be like okay um years of experience don't necessarily matter in this instance we're a senior software engineer um but it's a good sense of telling me how many experiences uh how many years of experience they have um and that you know it would you know be a pretty good prospect in that aspect i was reading some other questions here it looks like ben having an up-to-date profile, but having a lot of old irrelevant data from when you were in a different field, worth keeping. This is, again, it's not a perfect science, but I'll tell you what I actually do. So funny enough, I used to be a journalist uh, and I was a journalist for a while. And so I worked at USA Today and CBS and I keep the companies on there and the years that I worked there so that people know I wasn't you know, in space with Jeff Bezos or something during those years, I wish, but I don't really talk about what I did in those times because I don't want to appear in keyword searches for people looking to hire journalists and people in the media field because I left it behind. I'm not interested in media anymore. And so I actually only keep the detailed information of the jobs that are relevant to my recruiting experience because those are the jobs I'm interested in. That's the job I have now and that's my current field. So if I had done something previously that I felt really resonated with my uh, recruitment career, say I was previously in HR, I was an HR um, coordinator or something that was a related field, I would absolutely keep it because that's super valuable. Journalism is very different. It's not really transferable. I kind of started a new career path. So that's why I chose not to include it. But there is no perfect answer. You, you got to make the call for yourself if that is relevant information that you want to keep or not. But I personally made the choice not to keep it. 
Great. I think those were all of the questions that um, I saw, but please feel free to speak up um, and mute yourself if you have any additional questions. I was just- I have a question. Oh. <laughs> I, I was a uh, quick uh, recap. Um, you had mentioned in terms of for those that are looking for a career change, um, there was mention that it's okay to write aspiring and then what position you're aspiring to. Would that be something that gets placed as a uh, replacement of what your current title is? Or is that something more on the about section uh, that one would do that? So it almost, yeah, yeah, it, it, I think it can really depend. So right now, if I'm a recruiting team lead, but I was aspiring to be a recruiting manager, I would keep recruiting team lead as my title. And in the about section, or, you know, even in the open to new opportunity section, or perhaps both, I would say, I'm really excited and ready to take on the challenge of becoming a manager, or whatever that title I wanted was. I would say the only time that I would really fully replace the job title you have is again, if you really were trying to pivot careers altogether, say I was trying to uh, go into IT mm -hmm. and a lot of my skills today may, may not be valuable to uh, IT today, but I'm taking some courses, I'm doing some online stuff, trying to get myself prepared. Uh, I would actually put in my headline, aspiring IT analyst, so that people knew I am interested. I know that my profile doesn't show I have a lot of experience, but I'm ready to take on that role if you have something that's a little more entry level and I don't, you don't require five to six years of experience in it. Got it, thank you very much. I shared my question, but I'm happy to um, repeat it if you'd like. I shared it in the chat. I, I was just wondering, at what point do you look at the LinkedIn profile? Like, what is the sequence of events? Um, just to see how kind of it builds and whether, you know, what new information might we be able to add? Or is this, could this potentially be the first thing that recruiters look at? Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a really great question. So particularly, there's no way of sequence of events that we look at resume first or LinkedIn first. I think it's more of a recruiter preference. Uh, personally, I like to look at uh, the LinkedIn first, and then I'll go more into the resume if they have their resume attached. Uh, so that's another do. Um, if you're actively seeking a new role, um, you know, there is a section for you to attach your resume. So I'll look at the LinkedIn first, and then I will, you know, look at their resume next because for more detail. Um, Gina, is there a different way that you do things? There really isn't. That's very similar to how I do things. I would say that, you know, I start off my search a lot of the times. If I just post my job to our website, it's going to take a number of days to gain traction. So potentially, actually, the first candidates I'm getting into the process are coming through LinkedIn. So the first thing I'm doing is going to LinkedIn, searching, say I'm looking for a product manager, I'm going to be looking at people's titles, product managers at you know, different companies to see if, you know, if the hiring manager is only looking for people from mortgage, I'll start looking at mortgage companies. If they're interested in seeing people from all types of companies, my search might be wider. But yes, for a lot of the times, it's going to be the first thing I see when I talk to a candidate, and I'm going to be reaching out to them via LinkedIn as the very first step. Thank you. Monica, I think you had a question that perhaps we didn't get to yet. Um, you said, if we're changing careers and we've had years of experience in a different role, how do we use that experience and pivot into an associate level opportunity without seeming overqualified? How should I gauge what level of job, possibly above entry level, I can apply to, especially if we're aiming to grow in this new role? That's an amazing question. And it's, I think, one of those like one of almost the hardest questions to answer. I, I actually deal with this a, a lot in our current workplace, um, especially when it comes to internal transfers and internal mobility. People are really excited about the company. They love the company, but they might want to explore something different within their current company. Um, that's always something I would recommend to people first. Check if internally. They already know you. They know you're good at your job. You might have really great relationships internally. So people are more willing to take a bet on you because you know, somebody who has five years of experience in IT and you don't have any, 
it's more of a quote unquote risk. But if they know that you show up every day with a great attitude, you're a really hard worker, that's more of a calculated uh, bet that they might be getting, you know, somebody that they know is really great and, and they believe in and that can learn those skills really quickly. So I would always recommend doing that first. Um, but something I will say is that always try. You can reach out to jobs. You can reach out to people on LinkedIn. Um, and you know, don't tell yourself no before somebody else tells you no. So apply for the job. I would say I would not apply for anything that says, you know, maybe five years plus. I would try to target more one to four years is where you're going to be luckiest if you really don't have any experience. But similar to what we talked about earlier, say I was trying to get into IT, I would actually go look at all the job descriptions for the companies I wanted to work in and see if any of my skills were similar to the ones they listed. If they said I had to liaise with other business leaders, I would call out times that I had to do that in my job. And I would say this seems like a really valuable skill, you know, maybe in my cover letter to something you're looking for in an IT analyst who has to liaise with other business leaders. So try to find the commonalities, add that to your resume. And then also I would target one to four years if you truly don't have any experience in the field, but uh, you know, don't tell yourself no before somebody else does. You can also apply to the other ones. It, it probably isn't going to work out if it's seven, eight plus years of experience required, but you can always give it a shot and really make your case in the cover letter for why you believe your skills are valuable. And I think we have uh, a few more minutes uh, for additional questions. I see a question from Sam. Um, do, recruiter, do recruiters prefer the direct messages on LinkedIn, direct emails, best way to possibly to get visibility to support your application in your opinion. So I personally, you know, uh, there's no right or right, right or wrong answer. It's more about, you know, um, personal preference. I definitely prefer direct email um, in a sense that I can go into my contacts and forward it to the right recruiter if it's not a role that I support. You know, with LinkedIn, then we would have to, you know, forward the profile, um, maybe forget about it because we're doing a lot of different things. Um, so Gina, is there a way that you prefer to do things? I am also an email person and Lisa's right. Every individual organization will have their own preferences based on the tools they use. And also each individual recruiter has their own preferences. So that's why I said it's in your best bet to include your uh, email because you wanna make it as easy as possible. You just wanna be a click away from their message um, because they're moving so quickly that if you're very fast and they're easy, you know, like their favorite way to contact candidates, you're probably going to be one of the first people they contact. Looks like we have um, room for one more question. LinkedIn's top applicant. I actually don't know what that is, Lisa, do you? I have no idea. Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. Sorry that we don't have better answers for you there. Slack channel if you have more questions, but we're so happy to meet all of you. Thank you so much for having us. Have a great rest of your afternoon, um, wherever you're based. Um, and super excited to partner with TechRia for other future lunch and learns. Um, and feel free to join our you know, Slack channel. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you again, Better. And I really appreciate everyone for attending today and awesome questions coming in. I've definitely captured some of the advice that Gina, Lisa, and Veronica have shared. Um, and you'll see that across um, our internal pages. And you will also see a recording of this session within the next week or so on our YouTube for anyone who's interested.